cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so KPV is a peptide that's growing in popularity. It's one we've only touched on in the past in an older video on BPC-157 blends for gut health. Now we're going to revisit the topic, dive even deeper, as it's a component of these different peptide formulations or it's sold alone, touted for its anti-inflammatory and reparative effects. Like many peptides out there, KPV is named for its amino acid structure, K for lysine, P for proline, and V for valine. It's a tripeptide, meaning it's composed of three amino acids, and it actually represents a tiny segment or a fragment of alpha-MSH, alpha-melanocyte-stimulating hormone, particularly amino acids 11 through 13. Alpha-MSH is the peptide hormone that served as the basis for development of these other melanocortin peptides, melanotan-1, melanotan-2, PT-141, whose proposed uses fall more in line with the painless light exposure, sun tanning, and libido enhancement, respectively. The earliest of research on KPV, which was published in the mid-1980s, showed that the peptide had an ability to reduce fever in rabbits. But one thing that makes KPV interesting is that its primary actions aren't really seen to be through the melanocortin receptors, which is the case for the melanotans we just mentioned. Those peptides like MT1, MT2, PT141 trigger melanocortin receptor binding, which is essentially responsible for their actions. But KPV in particular doesn't really possess structural features that would favor its binding to melanocortin receptors, and the overlapping features that it does share with these melanotan peptides are independent of melanocortin receptor signaling, which is pretty cool. In particular, KPV seems to intermingle with pathways that signal inflammation, and it's been seen to inhibit nuclear factor kappa B and MAPK, which together result in reduced secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, like TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta, things that really signal inflammatory transformation and an inflammatory response. And although these signaling pathways are rather ubiquitous and apply to different organ systems and inflammation in general, KPV research in particular has taken a turn towards gastrointestinal health and disease. Thus, it's not too surprising we're seeing it along BPC-157, a peptide developed from gastric mucosa itself, and one that's thought to be tied to the brain-gut axis and GI dysfunction in general. One of the reasons why KPV is proposed to be useful in gastrointestinal processes is because some research supports that in human intestinal epithelial cells and immune T cells, the peptide is moved into these cells by what's called the PEPT1 transporter. Although PEPT1 isn't too present in healthy colon cells, it does seem to be more present and predominant when colonic cells are inflamed, and thus in states of inflammation like inflammatory bowel disease. The idea here is that PEPT1 can facilitate the activity of KPV and localize its action to intestinal cells. And in some mice induced with colitis, oral administration of KPV appeared to reduce the severity of disease as seen by by decreased presence of inflammatory cytokines, improved body weight recovery, decreased toxin-induced myeloperoxidase activity, which would indicate anti-inflammatory effects, and finally there were some altered structural features of the colon itself that would represent decreased inflammation. If we switch gears a bit, wound healing and skin health are other frontiers KPV is thought to influence. First, there's some older data that exists from the turn of the century that show some antimicrobial effects of KPV, in the sense that there was inhibited growth of Staph aureus and Candida albicans, a bacterial and fungal colony respectively, and more recently, some antimicrobial effects were seen with KPV in rodent MRSA wounds, so staph wounds, and particularly had benefit in rats with chemotherapy-induced mucositis and helped improve their weight recovery and food intake. So 
in a nutshell, KPV appeared to not only have some action against fungal and bacterial colonies, but also showed some wound healing features with regards to chemical mucositis, so infection and inflammation of the oral mucosa in rats. Remember how KPV is a fragment of alpha MSH? Well, the thing here is that unlike other melanocortin peptides like MT2, for instance, KPV can likely penetrate the skin, but without any of the notorious melanocortin pigmentation changes. Topical efficacy of KPV is still something that's under investigation. There's an idea that exists in some research that skin damage is required for its permeability, or the skin needs to have some damage for it to be adequately absorbed. And so perhaps this would apply to skin conditions like atopic dermatitis or eczema, for instance, where maybe the skin condition itself could actually favor absorption. And some other ideas here are that maybe microneedles or hydrogels could be tools to enhance dissolution of the peptide, which are some thoughts that research is starting to look at, or they have been over the past decade or so. We've already captured some of the wound healing effects seen with chemically induced mucositis, so it's also worth mentioning some of the older data also demonstrates improved corneal epithelial healing in rabbits with mechanically caused eye damage. With administration of KPV, though there may be some dependence on nitric oxide, as well. Finally, there's a study just published this year that looked at human keratinocyte cells that came in contact with a toxin representing airborne particulate matter which would cause inflammation and oxidative damage. And the same findings from other contexts were replicated in the sense that KPV's anti-inflammatory action is mediated through inhibition of nuclear factor kappa B as well as MAPK. And so, in a way, it's strengthening support for use of KPV in products aligned with skin health. Overall, there are two frontiers of potential that are quite apparent, gastrointestinal repair and wound healing. However, there's no human data on the subject and a limited amount of even preclinical animal studies. From the most foundational of dose-finding studies to more robust trials assessing long-term risk, KPV is simply put quite understudied at this point. How do we assess risk in a peptide whose most bullish of findings lie in small numbers of mice or even cell culture studies? Well, we really can't, or we can't safely, which is the point of this channel here to tell you what we know and what we don't know. It's quite clear there are anti-inflammatory effects of alpha MSH that the tiny peptide KPV replicates. However, best use case is also still quite clearly in the works. From a preclinical standpoint, we've got a few rodent studies and inflammatory bowel models, another showing decreased neutrophil infiltration in a mouse peritonitis model, and a couple on different types of wounds. I would, however, feel guilty if I didn't emphasize that there's no human data or appropriate clinical trials conducted to date, and so we're drawing our conclusions on some strong limitations. Overall, it was about time I covered this one. I'm definitely going to stay in the loop here as there's a lot to talk about it use in GI disorders, allergic and autoimmune conditions possibly, wound presence, and perhaps even as an antimicrobial agent. I see why it's a part of the oral BPC-157 blend. I don't know if I entirely support it based off the current status of data, but I digress, or I digest. We're talking about GI peptides here. Oh goodness. Regardless, Thank you for watching. Thanks to the Patreon subscriber who requested a KPV cover. What are your thoughts? What do you want to see next? And if you're looking for additional ways to support the channel, there are a few options. First and foremost, hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help a small time peptide buddy out. Additionally, you could subscribe to the Patreon where I'm open to user requests conversation about any topic really peptide related or otherwise. And it's just a growing community. We've also got the Peptide Codex, Growing Peptide Catalog that you can subscribe to, or the BPC-157 20-page educational guide, all of which will be linked in the description below. There's also a new free email list, so why not join up? Most importantly, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I appreciate it sincerely. Have a great day. I'll see you. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.